Tech Talk with Matthew Dickerson. A- 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 Matthew Dickerson. Tech, 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 tech talk. Tech, 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 tech talk. Sit back and relax. It's time to talk technology. Hello, children of the virtual age. Come on in. Take off your virtual boots. Grab yourself a tall, cool virtual drink. Pull up a virtual chair nice and close and listen up to our virtual guide for the future, Mr. Matthew Dickerson. Matt, it's great to be virtually here. How was your virtual week? Uh, my virtual week was great. And listeners can actually have a real drink if they like. Everything else virtual is fine. All right, but, okay, all right. but a virtual drink just sounds a little bit tedious, doesn't it? A little it? bit tired and, uh, yeah, a little bit disappointing in the end. <laughs> Probably right. <laughs> Good for the hangover, though. <laughs> so this week's been really interesting. One thing that I love is when you get feedback from people. And our topic last week around censorship from the likes of the Facebooks and the Googles, that was a really interesting topic. And we spent a bit of time exploring that whole topic and that generated a fair bit of discussion. I've received a fair bit of communication this week from various listeners. And thank you for people that do send in your questions or comments. Yeah, it's great to have a bit of interaction with a big bad world out uh, there. Yeah. It is. I really, I, it means people are listening to it, which is fantastic for a start, but also just the variety of opinions because that was a really tough one. And for people that didn't listen last week, it was really about the companies like the Googles and the Facebooks doing their own censorship of topics and whether or not either it's appropriate to censor things, some things, yeah, we agree that it is appropriate to censor, but how far they go and actually having a company for profit doing the censoring rather than a government making a democratic decision about yeah. that censorship. So, so it's sort of a delicate sort of a tightrope we've got to walk there, yeah? And as I think a, we walked it, we, we, you and I walked it quite well, I think, because we didn't actually <laughs> say, here's what we should do. It was really posing the questions and the emails I got from people were fantastic because they really were not having a go at us. So they were really saying, yeah, it's a really interesting topic and giving some opinions about that and giving their thoughts on it. So it really generated some thoughts and discussions with people out there, which I think is fantastic if we can do that. Yeah, yeah, super interesting. Mm. If there is one thing we have learned during lockdown, it is that there is video conferencing and then there is video conferencing. Am I right? If you want your video conferences to be remembered for the content of the meeting rather than the poor quality of the technology, then Crestron is the solution for you. Crestron is simple to deploy, simple to use, yet delivers exceptional performance. To improve your next video conference, visit meetwithcrestron.com forward slash tech talk. Some more stuff from the book of interesting for you today, folks. Look, if you're wondering how you're going to put a fence around a 200,000 hectare property, um, we've possibly got a solution for you. Uh, we've got a bit of a blast from the past with Nokia's making a bit of a comeback. And also, uh, I've got a question for you. How big can you build your wind turbine? Um, but we'll get into that a little bit later. Right now, let's talk about old cars, folks. Um, classic old cars. We'll have listeners out there for whom these beauties of ages gone by have a life and a personality of their own. They're not treasured possessions. They're part of the family, albeit the petrol-guzzling, carbon dioxide-belching uncle that pops his head in for special occasions. But the, uh, the world of classic cars is evolving. People are converting the style and glamour of old to, wait for it, electric. Matt, is this a form of classic motoring sacrilege? Well, for some people, I think it is, James. I've had a few people who have talked to me about this particular topic and they said, no, that's terrible. You're destroying these classic old cars. But I love it because I do like my cars. I've owned a couple of yeah. old cars that would now be classics, but they the were shiny chrome and the, yeah, all oh, that sort of, some yeah, of those yeah. old beautiful cars and some of the things like the, the Cadillacs and the Pontiacs that we see across the world or the V dubs or the Porsche 911, some of these old classic cars that really people absolutely love. And you go to car shows and I've been to lots of car shows over the years. I love some of those old cars, but you're right. They're not great for the environment, and probably some of those cars, they spend a fair bit of money on getting the engine right, because sometimes they've been sitting in a garage somewhere for 20 years, and the engine's rusted up, and there's a lot of money to spend there. So and a good, good mechanic knows how an engine's supposed to sound. Exactly right. <laughs> it's a lot of money to make it sound that way. Sometimes that was a problem. <laughs> yeah. So a lot of these old classic cars are being retrofitted with electric motors. And there's some cars that are easier to do than others, but there is this whole industry that's popping up now. And I did look at this about 18 months, say two years ago, and not many people were doing it. They saw it wasn't really a convenient way to do it. It was too expensive, so it was all too hard. But now we're really getting some people that are getting into this. And so there's people around the world, but there's people here in Australia that they're creating businesses. And I know there's a guy here that, that's got an old Mazda ute, and he's converted it himself, and it's 
probably got 50 kilometer range, not great. He's got this motor that he bought for not much, a couple of thousand dollars, just pulled out the old engine and dropped that in. But this is for show, right? He's driving it to his shows. Maybe he's putting it on the back of a trailer, he's taking it to a show. Well, he's actually just driving around because he loves the idea oh, okay. of it. Yeah, <laughs> but for enough. some of them, for cool. some of them, you're cool. right. They are driving them to shows, they are showing them off. But it's a bit of a surprise to people when you walk around that show and you look under the bonnet and you go, <laughs> what up? Where's all the engine gone? Because there's so much space. And, and, uh, and tick it over, mate. And he goes, <laughs> Presses the button and goes, ready to go. <laughs> so V-dubs apparently one of the popular ones. And the old joke about the V-dub, of course, is they made it that yeah, poorly. Daka, 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 daka. Yeah, they're the ones. But they made it that poorly that they forgot to put the engine in and just chucked it in the boot on the way out the door. But they're, they're really easy to actually convert over, apparently. So people are spending maybe $10,000 on converting a V-dub Beetle. Some of the classic Aussie cars, the Kingswoods, the Commodores, the Falcons, the Tiranas, are terrible to convert. Yeah, right. Because they're heavy clunkers. Oh, right. So even though you take the engine out and you put, a motor in, electric motor in, and some batteries, because they're so heavy, if you want to get a bit of decent range out of them, then you've got to have a fair few batteries. Uh, yeah, but sure. to stay within regulations, the weight of the car can't be more than the weight of the car when it was first manufactured. So if you put lots of batteries uh. in there, it starts to get too heavy. Because these cars are heavy already, they've got more batteries to be able to get them around. Classic Catch-22, I think, there, folks. Yeah, yeah, it is. But there's a few that have been done. I looked at a Commodore the other day. There's a 71-year-old farmer that's got a Commodore that's been converted to an EV. Yeah, right. So you are seeing all these classics. And even David Beckham, the famous English soccer star, is into it. He's got a company that he's part owner or part shareholder in that he's advertising now, not a bad spokesperson to have if you want to get a bit of publicity. Huh. They're converting Rolls Royces. But, nah, you know, I'm not sure that everyone will go for it. 500 thousand pounds to convert a beautiful old oh, Rolls Royce wow. to a full electric Rolls Royce. So, but I would have thought, you know, Rolls Royce is pretty heavy as well, aren't they? Well, I think that's part of the issue there. There's probably a fair bit of other engineering. Because again, if you own a Rolls Royce, you don't want to be charging up every 50 kilometres. You want to mm. have a decent bit of range <laughs> out of it. But it is happening. There's companies popping up. There's a little group already formed between New Zealand and Australian companies, nine companies in that group that are saying we're working out ways to do these electric vehicles better. Because some people are still spending thirty, forty thousand dollars on the conversion alone, obviously you can buy an electric vehicle for that amount, but people love their old classic cars. And when you've got an old classic, you might spend a lot of money doing it up and getting it back to its former glory. <laughs> you might spend that sort of money right, yeah. getting it back to its former glory and making it electric. Making it electric. Yeah, so the next car thing. show you go to, don't be surprised when someone pops the bonnet or pops the boot in the case of a V-Dub or a Porsche, and there's not the big petrol guzzler in there, it's a little electric motor. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, we did a story not long ago uh, about uh, getting sounds that can play while you're hitting the accelerator there. <laughs> well, in these cases, maybe before so you, you convert it. you get the car it, rev noise. Yeah, you can, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Before you convert it, do some recordings of the car itself to how it sounded, even if it's not timed right, even if the <laughs> engine's not sounding perfect. And then just when someone comes along and wants to hear it, you just press play on your phone and, and away you go. That's, that car sounds fantastic, just like it should sound despite the electric motor in there. <laughs> so yeah, there's a whole range of options there, but I just, I'm just i pretty excited by this because it does give those old classics a new lease of life. And in 20, 30 years' time, who knows, we'll see a lot more of these vehicles around, I think. And summer nats in Canberra is going to look very, very different as well too, <laughs> or sound very different, I should say. Yeah, sound, as long as they can smoke the tyres. That's yeah, the important yeah, yeah, thing. Yeah, as long as you can still <laughs> spin the tyres and get a cloud of smoke around you, people will be okay. And Matt, I've got a question for you. What's the worst job on a, a farm, a stock farm? Go. Well, I've done a little bit of helping out friends. I've never lived on a farm, but when I was growing up, I used to go out and get sucked into helping out friends. And you think it was just a coincidence, but it seemed to me that more often than not, when you go out to help on the farm over that weekend, fencing. You're doing fencing. Fencing. Exactly <laughs> right. That was going to be my point exactly. <laughs> Look, I would muck out a cow shed any day. <laughs> Um, but fencing, it's just so monotonous. It goes oh. on and on and on. And yeah, it's They've a got some better day, tools now, but I can remember when I used to have to dig holes to put posts in. I mean, yeah. you just want to use star pickets and use a star picket driver, but now they've got nice little electric borers that can dig a hole pretty quickly. But yeah, I can remember digging holes. I remember stringing wire and tensioning the wire. And, and you've got to try hard not to look up to see how far you've got <laughs> no, to go. No, you don't, don't do that. Don't do that at <laughs> all. It's going to break your heart. <laughs> <laughs> and the, well, the farms I'm talking about, when I used to go and help, weren't that big so mm. if you look down the fence line you probably could see to the end but there are some farms a bit bigger than that well yeah if you ring up a farmer in wa you'll see that i uh, might need to help um fencing is two hundred thousand hectares or whatever <laughs> which is just enormous there's got to be a better way um as we fumble our way into the third decade of the 21st century well you're right and so you're going to tell us. <laughs> I'm going to tell you that technology's got a solution everything that i talk about technology's got a solution for and you're right if we just give a quick 
bit of data around some of the, the farming areas in WA and the Pilbara in particular, the Pilbara region we'll pick on, mm. the average pastoral lease size there is just about 200,000 acres. So you've, sorry, the average pastoral lease there is 200,000 hectares. Yeah. So you've got a fair chunk of land. And if you had the perfect size, if you had a square there, just the perimeter fencing would be 180 kilometres. And they don't support many cattle. You've got one cattle or one cow per 60 hectares. So there's a thing called a cattle unit. Yeah, yeah. So it's a specific size beast, consumes a certain amount of food, et cetera, et cetera. So it's called a cattle unit. So you can have one cattle unit per 60 hectares. So you haven't got a lot of cows mm. in a small area. They're spread out over a big area. That's a lot of infrastructure for it not is. enough cows. And yeah. you just you want to fence the outside. No, of course you're going to have fences all through the inside. You want to change what paddocks are in, all the rest of it. So it's all pretty complicated. And some of these fences they put up there are expensive. You're talking about $4,000 per kilometre. So you've got three quarters of a million dollars just to do a perimeter fence around one of these yeah, properties. Wow. So expensive there. And then you get damn nature come along with floods yeah, and with sandy soil, and, yeah. all sorts of things. And so then they wreck the fences and you've got to go and start again or just do those sections mm-hmm. again. So technology has a solution. The solution is a collar around a cow's neck. And that collar, with all the modern technology we've got, has got solar panels on top, so it's got enough elect- uh, sorry, enough light during the day to charge up the batteries in it and keep it going forever. And then you've got a GPS tracker inside the collar, the same as your car or your phone might have. So you know, or the collar knows exactly where it is. You install a base station on the farm so it can transmit a very low-powered signal back to the base station and then you can track exactly where your cattle are, which sounds great. You know where they are. Oh, I know they've gotten through a fence and they've gone to the neighbour's property. Do you know there was a movie made in the 80s? I don't know if you ever saw it. It was an Arnold Schwarzenegger movie called Running Man. Anyone who's ever seen this will know what I'm talking about when, and have got an idea where you're going with this, but their collar would blow their head off if they went too far. <laughs> right? So it was, the collar got put on prisoners. There were no fences for the prisoners. They just, if they walked too far, bang, the head got blown off. Probably not a great way to make money out of your cattle, but no, I, no, I get right. the point. In this case, it's a little bit less destructive than that. Oh, okay. Right. <laughs> what happens is as well, they Hollywood. get close to that's right, as they get close to the fence line, a noise starts going off. And that noise grows in intensity as they get to the fence line. And then finally, this isn't the part that most people will love, but finally if they go over the fence line they get just a small electric shock in the collar. The same as if they had an electric fence there and they got a small electric shock when they bumped against the electric fence. And the cows, within forty eight hours, they're pretty smart, they say, Hey, I know what happens if I keep walking and this noise is going off, yeah, right. I'm going to turn around. So yeah, it only right. takes them two days to learn, and then you've got a virtual fence. So you've now got a cow that's got a collar around their neck, $40, so not very expensive, and you can then sit back on your computer as the farmer, draw where you want your fence line to be, that's it. The cows will stay within that area. So I can only assume that once they get that little zap, they don't get all startled and, and just run in whatever direction, <laughs> end up running in the wrong direction, just getting zap, 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 zap. Well, that, that's a good <laughs> point. Assume. Yeah. They, well, we hope so. When I've read some of the research on this, it seems like they learn that to turn around and go back, and they learn pretty quickly about that. I'm hopeful they don't keep zapping them more and more intense than it is. They get further and further away. But I think the build-up of the noise as well is part of the thing that will bring them back. The RSPCA isn't entirely happy about this. They're not entirely happy about the amount of stress it might create for these animals. But at the same time, it's actually better from a productivity perspective for the farmers. And they can actually treat their land better because when you're a farmer that's trying to really look after your land, you might have, for example, some paddocks that you want to leave fallow. You want to keep any cattle off them for a period of time. Let some of the the brush on there regrow. Let some of the, the land recover. But it's pretty hard work to move those cattle around, especially when you've got one per 60 hectares. Mm. Move them around manually. Helicopters are often involved. That gets pretty expensive. And then move them in another paddock. More fences you've got to look after. Whereas with this, you can just redraw on a computer screen where you want the actual fence to be. Wow. So the interesting part here is that Rio Tinto is the one trialling this at the moment. And Rio Tinto, what's going on there? They're a farming company. Why are they involved in this? When Rio Tinto go and buy a chunk of land to do some of their they're mining on, often it's farmland, and they want to keep using the farm for farmland as much as possible. The mine only might take up a small part of it, but they like a buffer zone around it. So Rio Tinto are actually a big farmer as well, and one of the problems they had was that these cattle would get onto mining sites, they'd get through fences that were protecting mining sites, they'd chew on some infrastructure, or they might just get in the road of some of the mining trucks, so it was a bit of a problem for them. 
this virtual fencing, they believe, will be better to manage the cattle they've got near some of these mine sites. So they've got 100 cows right now as we speak with these collars on. The next step of the trial will be 500 cattle. And then if that's successful, they'll go to all of their flock. So it, it is interesting. The real issue here, I suppose, is legislation. We've talked about it before. Catching up with where the technology is at. So at the moment, most states in Australia, including WA, it's illegal to actually put these on your cattle. They've given permission for Rio Tino to run this trial, but if a farmer went out there and said, oh, gee, that sounds like a great idea, I'll go yeah. and put some on my cattle, no, it's illegal. Hopefully, once the trial is successful and they prove that it's not dangerous to the animals and it all works successfully, then they might... And it, it works in a similar way that an electric fence already does work, and we have those already, yeah. Correct, that's exactly right. Yeah, around the neck might be a little bit different. That might be some of the argument from the RSPCA. I'm not an expert on animal health, so I'm talking about the technology. I don't want to make any comment here about <laughs> animal health on there. But again, I think this is probably safer to keep your cattle in the areas. I suppose the only downside are the predators. You still get some dingoes, some wild dogs. Yeah, right. If there's not a fence there, that's not keeping them out. I'm not sure if the farmers have explored putting some collars on some wild dogs or some dingoes. <laughs> so maybe that'd be an option. <laughs> yeah, look, and also there's there's that romantic imagery that's going to go uh, all, all to the to pot now that, uh, you know, people riding on horses, they muster cattle. You know, this is the the image that we've been projecting to the rest of the world. That, yeah. You know, we, we, we do it pretty tough in the outback out here and you, know, ju- you know, jump on your horse and you muster your cattle or maybe ride in your helicopter and muster your cattle that way. That's really romantic. Well, now that's all... Well, you one of my favourite on his computer screen. That's right. One of my favourite poems, "Clancy the Overflow" by Banjo oh, Patterson, has that beautiful yeah. romantic notion of exactly that. You're riding along the Darling and mm. mustering cattle, and oh, sounds fantastic. Looking at the stars, and oh, now you're right, sitting in. Poets got nothing to write about these days. <laughs> that's right, sitting in an office, drawing some lines on the screen. And go, there you go. That's my new paddock for the day. <laughs> and I woke up a sweat. I wonder if uh, that idea will catch on at daycare centres. <laughs> well, I did wonder that myself. <laughs> Can I control my kids like this? <laughs> Maybe more people than the RSPCA will have something to say about that one, James. <laughs> now, here's a memory for you, folks. Nokia. 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 Or maybe you say Nokia. Uh, it's, it's like a breeze of nostalgia, a wisp of wind in the back of your mind, memories of days gone by, of, of simpler times free of COVID lockdowns, Trump politics and fake news. Nokia. Matthew's going to be telling us right now that everything old is new again. Matt, has some digital Frank to, uh, Dr. Frankenstein raided the electronic graveyard and brought back to life something that was well and truly done and dusted? Speaking of romantic poems, James, that was getting me all, all, all teared up then listening to you talking I about the to, past. I was trying to really impact there, but uh, yeah, yeah. You know, I might have missed the mark. And it's interesting, we sometimes have different pronunciations. So I would say Nokia, you say you? Nokia. Oh, maybe I'm just too American. <laughs> yeah, maybe. Yeah, okay. <laughs> For a Swedish Well, company, it's been so long. Oh, well, true, true. That's exactly <laughs> right. So the... Nokia obviously went broke, so the smartphone thing came along, damn it, and wrecked the whole company. They didn't keep up with what was happening. And another company's bought them out now, but they've bought the brand name effectively. And Mm. so what they're doing to try and generate some money out of the brand name is they re-release some of the old classics. Now, who was The flip phone. (laughs) The flip phone is one of them. The 5110. I don't know who didn't own a 5110 in their (laughs) lifetime at some stage. But who wants to buy a phone that's 20 years old? Of course, no one, because we've moved on since 20, Mm. 20 years ago. We didn't have 4G 20 years ago, 3G networks being shut down. So you wouldn't want to buy a phone that was 20 years but old. I do miss my snake. Yeah. Can I download an app for snake? These I haven't even checked. I just re- remembered how much I miss snake. Yeah, you probably could. But what Nokia is doing is they're re-releasing some of the old classics. And in this case, it's the 20th anniversary of the 6310. And they're re-releasing some of these with a bit not much, but a bit more modernness to them. And so the 6310, they've made it so they'll work on modern networks. They've given it a slightly bigger screen. They've tried to keep the essence of the size of the phone, although it's a little bit bigger. Not a touch screen, but you can do a few things on it that you couldn't do with the old 6310, including a little bit of extra speed to access the internet, for example. But it's still a snake. That's the most uh, important part. <laughs> Right, excellent. <laughs> and I think they're selling these for something like $70. For that kind of money, it'd be worth it just to buy that to just play Snake on, wouldn't oh, it? Oh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. But um, there's also that retro feel. Like, if you're going to yeah. drive around your classic car, then there's no surely there's no problem with pulling out your old Nokia. Nokia 6310, that's <laughs> <laughs> So you've got your EV, your Porsche 911 that's got an EV in it, and you pull out your Nokia 6310, and as long as you've got some reflective sunglasses on as well, you are completely retro then. <laughs> so they had a battery that would go forever as well. Well, they did because they didn't have to do much, no, they did they? Much, right. <laughs> it wasn't like a smartphone <laughs> with this huge screen on there. But I think they're actually popular in a small extent because you've got some people who go – out and do some outdoorsy things, ride motorbikes, ride horses, whatever it might be. 
And of course, they've taken smartphones with them in the past mm, and they well, fall they off smashed. and they get smashed pretty easily. But you still want to have a phone with you in case you do fall off. You want to be able to ring triple O and say, help. Yeah. So people are doing this sort of thing where they're taking the SIM card out of their normal smartphone, yeah, right. going out for a weekend, sticking in a phone so they've got an emergency phone. But even sitting around a campfire around the river with some friends, you don't want to be sitting there checking on your social media and yeah. all the rest of it. You've got a phone. Sure, I can make a phone call if I need to. Sure, send a text, but a bit clumsy because you've got three letters per number. The old way you used to text and the adaptive <laughs> yeah, text for that. that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and yeah. so you've got all that, but more importantly, you haven't got the things that you don't really need when you're out camping or out sitting around the river with a bunch of friends. So the 6310, I think they'll sell a few. Hmm. Maybe not the sort of quantity that the Samsungs and the Apple sell of their smartphones, but I think they'll sell a few and they'll keep doing this. They'll keep re-releasing some of these old classics and people will go on the nostalgia band. We've talked about some nostalgia just stuff before. Yeah, it's amazing. Love it. Well, I love it. Well, <laughs> <laughs> well, the thing is, I think that the people they're appealing to have now got the cash to be able to buy some of these things mm. when you're in your 20s or maybe in your teens. You couldn't afford maybe a mm. 6310. They're a bit too flash for the day, but now people might be in their 40s. They can actually afford it and they buy it just for nostalgia value. Yeah. Oh, well, I, I, I welcome it back with <laughs> open arms. Now, QR codes, folks, they're everywhere. Not so long ago, they were a novelty. Now I can't walk through a door without checking in these days. In fact, we've got them up in the house. Uh, well, not quite. Just at the bathroom, that's all. Um, <laughs> but as regulations start to relax and we ease out of COVID, what's to become of the humble QR code? I love the fact that we know what a QR code is now. <laughs> I've had business cards printed about six years ago. QR code on the back. And I used to show people, look at this, you can scan that. And that's an interesting <laughs> pattern. Well, they'd look at that and go, what is this? I'd scan that. I'd show them. You can look at that. You can just take my details and put it straight in your address book. Maybe they didn't want my details in their address book. I'm not <laughs> sure, but I reckon I was the only one that ever scanned my business card. Until now, my business cards have still got QR codes, and people say, oh, that's a good idea. You've gotten onto the QR code thing. No, I did it years ago. <laughs> but anyway, you're right. People know what a QR code is. But once we get into full, open, back-to-normal society – I can't imagine we'll see a QR code again because we won't be checking everywhere we go. Yeah. Your house, you'll have to take it off the bathroom door. Who knows? It'll be just... Back to a, <laughs> yeah. be back a nostalgia. To the novelty. Well, yeah. there'll be a nostalgia thing then. <laughs> so maybe they'll, they'll be reinvented. But QR codes are soon going to be used. And we're talking about Christmas this year when you go through and check out from, say, a, a Coles or a Woolies, some major supermarket. And there's some big companies involved in this. The Commonwealth Bank, the National Australia Bank, Coles and Woolies that I mentioned are all behind this thing called an EQR. And they're talking about this making payment systems faster and quicker at checkout. All right. And I'm a bit dubious. And it's not often I talk about one of these topics I'm a bit dubious about. I love all the technology we talk about. But in this one, the marketing says it'll be a quicker way to check out when you go through the checkout or whatever your favorite story is. And I'm thinking, it's pretty quick now. When I get to the checkout, yeah. I wave my watch in front of the FPOS machine or you wave your card, tap and go. And that's pretty quick. I just yeah. I don't remember waving How my watch and sitting there <laughs> for 30 <laughs> seconds waiting for something to happen. A QR code's going to be quicker than that. It's well, I know that I'm always hold up. Yeah, I've always got to pause for a little bit longer before I walk into a shop now while I fumble around with my with my QR code. <laughs> yeah. You know, and um, yeah, yeah, I don't know. That'd so the I, the idea here will be you'll have an app on your phone. It might be incorporated with the app that's with the store you're shopping with, for example, if you want some reward points or whatever it might be. And the QR code will come up when you finish your shopping. There's the amount, sir, $58 for your shopping. And there's a QR code. You'll just scan the QR code like you do with your phone now, and automatically that will do the payment from whatever your preferred app is. But again, that sounds like about the same amount of time to wave my Mm. phone or my watch or whatever it might be. So is it going to take off? Well, we love QR codes now, so people (laughs) want to show off how clever they are in using their QR codes. But the only thing I can see, the only advantage I can see is that you might get some extra information. So if you had... A reward or a loyalty card, it could do all of that at the same time. So you could scan the QR code, it would give you some points on your loyalty card and do the payment at the same time. Maybe that takes the two steps that it is now down to one step. Is that enough to get it over the line? There's a new app you've got to install, you've got to link that with your bank account. Uh, yeah. I don't know. Yeah. I'm oh, not look, convinced. Any pausing that happened at the checkout, it's usually for pleasant conversation as well. <laughs> um, and so we cut out that pleasant conversation. That was when we could chat before we had a mask yeah. on our face where you couldn't <laughs> yeah. hear what each other was Good saying. Good point. <laughs> anyway, keep an eye out for that. That's apparently by Christmas time we'll see that. Wow. And again, major supermarkets, yes. Other retailers will get on board as well, presumably, because you don't want to limit your ability for your customers to pay in whatever method that they mm. want to pay with. So I'm sure if it starts to take off, everyone will be onto it. But yeah, again, how many ways do we need to pay for something? Mm. Yeah. Well, certainly if you're still paying in coins, um, <laughs> probably ready to move on with that then. Maybe, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> 
The world has changed dramatically over the last 18 months and the new normal will involve a hybrid workforce with video conferencing a part of that mix. You need your staff to focus on what really matters, the meeting, not the technology. Crestron can help your Teams or Zoom or WebEx meeting rooms work first time, every time, because Crestron is all about you. It is simple to deploy, simple to manage and a joy to use. To use video conferencing that adapts to the way you want to work, visit meetwithcrestron.com forward slash tech talk. All right, here's something I'll wager you've never considered even once in your life. Wind turbines are bloody big. I figure the, the windier the hillside, the bigger the turbine. So, um, yeah, the more lecky they're going to produce. Matt, is there a limit to how big these things can get? Oh, there's got to be a limit at some stage, but we're not seeing them slow down at yeah, the moment. Yeah, right. Four years ago, the maximum capacity for an offshore turbine, and offshore ones are typically larger because you don't have to worry so much mm-hmm. about what's around the, on the land and you can put it up out in the ocean and it's a bit easier. So the maximum size four years ago was eight megawatts, which is a fair-sized turbine. yeah. They're now putting up some wind turbines. There's a Danish wind turbine manufacturer that's putting up 15 megawatt towers. Now, wow. to give you an idea of a 15 megawatt that's tower... That's almost double the size. That is. That's right. Gee, <laughs> I can tell you're a science teacher. Look at that. <laughs> the, the size of that would power about 13,000 homes. So one yeah, turbine, wow. you could go along to a small or even a medium-sized town or city and say, we're well, going to put a turbine in for you, and that's going to power... The entire town, yeah. so it's not bad. All the, all the, not the shops, but all the homes in that particular place. So that's pretty big. But in China, they're working on another one that's sixteen megawatts. They're talking about twenty megawatts being the next thing that they're aiming towards. So they are getting big. And again, to give you an idea of how big these are, a fifteen megawatt turbine, one turn of the turbine blades, one complete revolution, yeah. would be enough power to power an electric vehicle for 350 kilometres. <laughs> <laughs> so, want to charge up your car? Just spin that yeah. once. There we go. Wow. <laughs> so, these things are big. Now, I've stood beside, I went along to a construction of a wind farm just to have a look. I was fascinated by it and I had a couple of days touring around with them and being shown the technology there. And I stood beside the road at one stage when one of the blades was being transported by the semi-trailer. Yeah, right. And I stood there and when I I was looking at the turbines up on the actual, or the blades up on the turbines. I went, yeah, pretty big. Standing beside the roadway, and yeah, this turbine goodness, went past. Like I went, train. it was big, and I went, that's pretty big. Now those turbines were only about five megawatts in size, or those wind turbines there. Tiny. So when you get to some of these, the turbine length, the blade length we're talking about here, 115 meters long per blade. That is ridiculous. <laughs> so that's big. So the actual. Uh, what the diameter, if you like, of what it's spinning out there is 236 metres. And, of wow. course, the blade spinning, the longer you make those blades, the faster the tip's going to be. Mm. So you get those tips spinning at about 324 kilometres an hour. So they've got a bit of speed about them. <laughs> now, most of these ones are going offshore, as I said before. The, the logistics, the problem with the size is really getting to how do I make the thing? How do I get the thing out there? Now, one of the reasons they're doing these bigger ones out in the ocean is because it's easier to put it on a ship, to put it on some sort of barge and get it out there, getting it down roads, saying, oh, we need to construct it over there on that hill when you've got a windy road to get there. Sometimes, and I've seen this happen as well, where they've actually had to cut trees down along the route mm. of a wind turbine path, if you like, or to get the components there, to actually get some of these so blades around corners. Navigate corners, yeah. 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 But wow. out in the ocean, not as bad, obviously. Make the things near the port and then get it on a ship or a barge yeah. and get it out there. But they're talking about, say, 20 megawatts sort of size there, the experts are saying within a couple of years we'll see that 15 megawatts is a standard size. And the good part about that is that you reduce the amount of infrastructure you need to get it there. So in other words, when you've got one turbine of say 8 megawatts, you've got all your connections you've got to get to that and the cabling and the Mm. footings and all the rest of it. You've got two turbines of 8 megawatts, you've got twice as many connections and footings, or one of 16, obviously there's an efficiency in the scale there. They are using, we talked about it last week, our whole eye opening with DC versus AC, most of these turbines are using DC to get the power from the offshore onto yeah, the actual wow. land. Yeah. But again, they've got to convert that from where they're getting it to and get it back there. So the fewer connections they've got to do, the better it is. So we'll see them get bigger and bigger. When do they get too large? Yes, there has to be a physical 
limitation. The materials, the actual construction of those materials has to get to some sort of limit. But at the moment, we're racing to 20, and who knows beyond that? Yeah, we can't see the end just yet. Mm. Ah, that's going to be int- very interesting to watch. Um, and, and actually to see uh, a wind farm offshore, um, it's, it's an impressive sight to see. It is. Actually, one of my favourites, there's a bridge in... Copenhagen, there was a bridge called the Ostrasan Bridge, and it was fascinating because it was half above water and half a tunnel. All right. So you'd go across this bridge and you'd go under the water halfway along. It looked very scary when you're driving along, and you're looking, you're going, <laughs> you're just we're just going to go into the ocean. What's going on here? Stop it now. But it joins up Sweden to Copenhagen, and I remember I was catching a plane from Copenhagen, and I said to the taxi driver, I've got a bit of time on my sleeve, can you take me across that bridge and then bring me back? And the taxi driver thought I was a bit crazy and maybe couldn't understand my translation of what I was trying to say. But I said, I just want to go on that bridge. I just think it's fascinating. So we're driving across this ostracand and halfway across I looked out into the ocean and there's a whole bunch of wind oh, turbines, yeah, about thirty wind right. turbines. And I went, Wow I was just excited about going on the bridge, but look at those wind turbines out. They look fascinating. So the, it, Got your money's worth that I day. did, that's right. But I just, I, I agree with you entirely. It does look really impressive because you see wind turbines out on land. They're typically on hills and they're spotted at different places where they've found the best wind flow. But mm. out in the ocean, they mm. just look like this beautiful array mm. of wind turbines. Mm. Mm. Now, the weirdest thing happened to me a little while back, um, and it's, it's all to do with the smart doorbells. I went to drop a parcel around at a friend's place, and I rang the doorbell, but clearly there was no one home. So I popped the package down behind a pot plant and headed down the driveway, and then I heard a voice. It was my friend talking to me through the doorbell ringer. <laughs> Only they were in hol- holidays on the coast. Uh, and they could see and hear everything that I was doing. So we had a chat on the front doorstep. It was just bizarre. Um, so now that was a new experience for me, but I get it. The tech's nothing new. Lots of people have got smart doorbells. But did you ever consider that one of those smart doorbells might land you in a bit of trouble with the law? I'd never thought of that. I'd never thought that this would be something that the legal profession would stick this, their nose into. Yeah. We have talked about those poor old solicitors have got to put a bit of food and water on their table, so yeah. maybe this is another yeah, one of those yeah, examples. Yeah. Save the starving solicitor. That's right, but a judge in the UK actually agreed with the solicitors that brought this case forward. Wow. And there was a, a person in Oxfordshire and basically put a smart doorbell on, put one camera in the backyard, and was quite proud of it. So he showed his neighbour. He said, look at these cool things I've got now. I can, exactly as you did, I can be anywhere in the world and I can have my smartphone, I can talk to someone at the front door and isn't this fascinating? Look yeah. at this technology. And the neighbour was quite horrified by this. Well, that doorbell could possibly see into my yard, said the neighbour. And that one in the backyard, well, it can't see my backyard, but you could hear me in the backyard because the camera doesn't need to be pointing at me. She got very anxious, left her home, and then, of course, ring a solicitor, and away it goes. And so the judge said, yes, I believe that you're in breach of two laws in the UK, the UK Data Protection Act and the UK GDPR. So the judge actually said, you need to take them down. There's probably going to be a fine on your way as well. But essentially, the judge said this is an invasion of privacy for the next door neighbour, both on that oh, audio wow. and the actual video level as well. And so it was a really interesting case, which again, the amount of domestic CCTV we're seeing around the world, yeah. these smart doorbells, the cameras in the backyard, there's cameras with SIM cards in them, with solar panels, they're very convenient to put up. Yeah. All of those things are now going to be brought into question by, I believe, this one case. We might see a few more test cases. We might see a few more neighbours say, hey, here's a way to get a few dollars out of my next door neighbour. And so you might see a plethora of cases being brought forward from this one example. But it's something that you probably didn't think about when you put that cool doorbell on and said, hey, look at this, I can talk to anyone <laughs> from anywhere. But it's, uh, I suppose, be warned now that someone in your neighbourhood, I suppose yeah, maybe me. don't show your neighbours. Probably that's the important yeah, lesson yeah, of this. Don't tell your neighbours, no. <laughs> yeah, put it on, don't tell <laughs> anyone else about it, and hopefully your neighbour doesn't knock on the front door. Oh, <laughs> but right. it is, it, it's, I can see where people are coming from, but it's a bit disappointing because a lot of this protection and home security is much better with cameras because I find mm. that people that put these on have fewer break-ins because alarms, they can get around or they can get in with a certain amount of time and steal stuff and get out. But cameras, they don't like cameras, especially when they record to the cloud because you can get in, yeah. steal that camera, smash it to the ground, destroy it, destroy any video recording equipment, but it's in the cloud. They, they can't break the cloud. They can't destroy the cloud. And so I'm sure it would be very disconcerting if someone heard a voice saying, hey, mate, I can see that you're trying to get through my front door or through <laughs> yeah. the window there. And you would say, okay, well, I'm not going here. I'll go to the next door neighbour. Maybe that's why this neighbour was offended because <laughs> yeah. it just meant they were going to come and break into her place instead of this guy's place. <laughs> Ah, oh, goodness me. We are a world gone crazy. 
Toyota has been standing their ground on fossil fuel chuggers, uh, waving their flag in a burgeoning EV marketplace as the last bastion for the petrol and diesel drives. But all that is set to change now, Matt. Has Toyota caved? I hope they have. I hope they've finally seen the writing on the wall. And it's only back in July this year that it was reported that Toyota officials were meeting with Biden government officials in the US trying to say, stop putting all these incentives in place for these damned EVs, will you? What are you doing? Are you crazy? They're not going to catch on. What are you wasting your time for? It's a, it's a little thing that'll yeah. pop up and go away. It's a fad. It'll all be gone soon. So they were actually arguing against those incentives, and obviously they didn't get very far. They probably mm. got some very short change back from the Biden officials. And so now they've said, oh, OK, well, you can't beat them. We might as well join them. And unfortunately, the thing that frustrates me about Toyota is they were one of the first to the game, the Prius. I remember owning a Prius, and I bought a Prius back in about 2005. I loved it. I thought, this is fantastic. This is the future. We've got batteries involved with internal combustion engines. It won't be long now. The engine will be gone. It'll just be batteries and a motor, an electric motor. But they haven't really moved that far forward, Toyota, mm-hmm. since that. In 2005, I bought one, but they, they released their first Prius before that. I think their first Prius came out in about 1997. So they were the market leader in that concept at the time. But they've kind of sat there and rested on the laurels to a certain extent. And all these other upstarts, the Teslas of the world, have come along and produced these wonderful EVs. And lots of manufacturers, VW, are betting their whole future on it. And Toyota's going, no, can you just stop those incentives? <laughs> but now they finally said, OK, we're going to get serious about this. So they're building a new... $1.3 billion factory in the US. They've committed $3.4 billion to battery development and factories alone in the US through to the year 2030. So they're actually getting a bit serious about it. They, yeah, wow. They said they'll generate 1,750 jobs in this one factory alone. And part of the problem for Toyota, I understand, is that they produce so many cars, if they suddenly went all EV, and I don't think you'd, you'd do that anyway, but if you suddenly went all EV, they just don't have the capacity in all the world production of batteries to satisfy the demand that might be there for Toyotas. But that's not good enough reason to stick your head in the sand. It's a better reason to go and spend $1.3 billion on a factory. So that's what they're doing. And so I think this is good. Ford, though, I mean, Ford's spending $11.4 billion on battery facilities, and that's in the US again. So Toyota's spending some serious money, but they've got a bit of catching up to do as well. Some of the other manufacturers that are already doing it, but some of the traditional ones like the Fords, like the General Motors, they're getting pretty serious about it as well. And what's great about it for their, from their perspective is the Biden government, some of these incentives they're putting in place are for US made. So the Fords and the General Motors, mm. they're well and truly behind it now because they know that will give them an advantage over the Toyotas of the world. So Toyota have got a bit of a battleground in the US, I think, coming up. They do, and probably someone read them the story of King Canute trying to hold back the tide as well. <laughs> and so, yeah, sometimes you've just got to admit defeat. You can't beat them, join them. Can you imagine walking into the boardroom of Toyota and saying, look, I've just got a little nursery rhyme, a little, yeah. little fable yeah. here for fable you today. Yeah. I might just give you that story. There's a moral. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> Bad news for hallway bullies in the school corridors of the UK. Lunch money is becoming a thing of the past. Rattling kids for their coins is set to become both fruitless and noiseless. Paying for your lunch money, at, uh, sorry, paying for your lunch rather, at the tuck shop will be much easier uh, than just reaching into your pockets. Kids will just smile into a camera now. Paying by facial rec- recognition is set to become commonplace, Matt. I used to bury my money. I remember being. <laughs> I remember being in. I, I, I haven't it's... dressed up a whole lot of nasty memories for you. <laughs> no, I? you've just reminded me of something. I remember being in about first class, I think it was, and I remember going to school and burying some money. And you had twenty five cents. It was at most. At most, I reckon twenty cents at best. And some copper in there as well. And I don't know whether it was because I was getting beaten up by some bully and they were going to steal my lunch money. <laughs> well, I was just going to save it to lunchtime, but it was only buried for half a day and then I'd, great I'd dig it up again. Yeah, <laughs> so, yeah, and you could play Treasure Island later I don't know. On. I don't know why. <laughs> I, be- I, I remember burying it. I remember a couple of us sitting around burying our money together and then we'd dig it up at lunchtime and go and pay for our lunch. Uh, but yeah, you're right. You wouldn't need to do that anymore. You just need to bury your face, which doesn't quite make <laughs> sense, would it? But in the UK, there's nine schools now that have gotten together and they're using facial recognition to pay for your lunch. So you walk up to the canteen, you mm. say, there's my lunch order, or you order the lunch. Talk about a quick checkout. A very quick checkout, that's right. Show your face and away you go. And that's great. I love the idea of using the technology and the parents seem to be on board with it. 97% of the parents have signed up and said it's okay to have my child's face scanned into your database. That's all good. But of course, some privacy groups have jumped up and down and mm. said, oh, I'm not sure if this is where we want to go. You're teaching these kids to have their face scanned into a database, a private database presumably, and then the next step they get into their adult life and it's all okay to have their face scanned and say, oh, what's next? This is all terrible. I'm not convinced. I think it's okay. I think using your face as a form of ID 
is pretty good because we know people get their identity stolen and mm. they get their identity stolen based on their name and their date of birth typically and that's it. Whereas your face, is, your face is yours. Unless you're going to be Mission Impossible and have a complete mask made up of your face to be able to get into places with your facial recognition, most people aren't going to go that far. So it's probably easier to steal your identity without facial recognition built in there. But yeah, I think it's quite good. I think it's a way to see schools moving ahead from a technology perspective. Yeah, awesome. Um, but I, I do, my heart goes out to that, that kid whose tab has run out of the tuck shop <laughs> and he's standing there and he, no amount of smiling gets you out of that trouble, mate. <laughs> Keep skiing. Do it again. Do it again. Yeah, I'll smile a bit more. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> now set to really change the face uh-huh, of how we um, how talk, talk shops run. Is that the best you can come up with? Oh, <laughs> Sorry. Remember your first iPod. Remember how many songs you could fit in it. Well, the first generation held so many songs it was like having like a ten CD stacker that you could fit in your pocket. They were amazing. That was the cat's meow, as you might say. Well, how long ago did you think that was? If you guessed anything less than 20 years, you're in for a shock, Grandpa. The iPod is 20 this year. When it landed, it seemed revolutionary. It helped Apple to skyrocket as a, as a global market and a, a tech powerhouse just uh, absolutely exploded onto the scene. But the tech wasn't new. Matthew, what was it about the iPod that allowed Steve Jobs and Apple to ex- just explode? Well, before I answer that question, I want to know what your first iPod was. You've asked the listeners now. Do you remember oh, yeah. your first well, iPod? Well, actually, I didn't pick up an iPod. Uh, I was very slow off the mark, and it must have been must have been around 2007, 2008, I reckon. Right. So that was probably around the Classic or the Touch range, or maybe the yeah. Nano. Oh, no, it was a Nano, so yeah, it must right. have been later. Right, no, no, the Nanos came oh. out, the first Nano came out about 2005. Yeah, okay. Yeah, and there were yeah, some multiple okay. generations yeah, of the Nano. Yeah, I'm thinking about when I might have started running. And yeah, right. Yeah, okay, so it must have been around about sort of 2008, 2009. Yeah, and I, my first one was a Nano, and I loved the Nano because it was very small. I'm trying to remember, they were probably 30 millimetres square or something yeah, like that, and you'd yeah, yeah. clip it in your shirt. I'd use it when I go for a bike ride, I'd clip it on my shirt, but and then away you go. had no screen. It was like, what do you do? There's no. no screen. There's nothing to look at. That's it's right. You'd set, up your, you'd set up your playlist in iTunes <laughs> and then put it on your, your couldn't do what you do now where you start skipping songs and doing yeah. all sorts of things. It was just put it on and go. And that was it. But it just was so small and convenient and just so fantastic. Uh, just Anyway, yeah. there's, yeah. there's been about 17 different models, believe it or not, that have come out over the years. And yeah, to wow. answer your question, it wasn't the iPod that really sent Apple through the stratosphere. Most people think, yeah, the iPod, that revolutionised the whole music oh, industry. Yeah, that's what I would have said. Yeah. Yeah. Now, Creative Labs, for example, had an MP3 player that – was arguably more impressive than the first iPod that came out, and it was out sooner. There were some other companies that had MP3 players. So the whole concept of an MP3 player wasn't Apple's to own. Apple did two things. One, Apple in history have sometimes come along with some new ideas, but they've sometimes taken a normal idea and said, let's make it actually work really easily. Mm. So they did that to the iPod. But then it was still a bit clumsy. You still had to get CDs. I used to remember getting CDs out and you'd put them yeah. in the computer and then you'd rip them off there onto your iPod and it was all a bit clumsy and you'd try yeah. and show someone how to do that and they'd oh, just put a CD player in or they'd have a, a Walkman type. Have the, yeah, the Discman. <laughs> That's right, the Discman. That if you, if you were a bit rough with it, then it just skipped all the time. Exactly right, whereas the tapes didn't, yeah. but the, the Discman did. <laughs> but even cars, cars came with the stacker in the CD, sorry, the stacker in the boot, if you remember. Yeah. And then the really flash cars had the stacker in the dash where you'd feed six CDs That's into the right. dash. But you could have, like, you could cycle through six CDs. And when the, the iPod came out, it was like, well... I can have like 10 CDs. I can fit them all in my pocket. <laughs> wow. I think Steve Jobs said a thousand songs in your pocket was a big thing. And at the media launch, when they gave out iPods to all the assembled media, because you had to rip CDs to actually put them on the iPod, you had to own those CDs, they gave out the iPods to show the journos, look at this great thing. Mm. But they also had to give them the 20 CDs that were on the iPod, otherwise they'd be in breach of copyright. <laughs> so, so they got this little iPod, look at this, put it in your pocket, and here's the 20 CDs. And here's in a, a bag box. <laughs> full of stuff that you'll never use. <laughs> That's right. You don't need it anymore. So it wasn't the iPod, which did come out in October 20, 2001, was when the iPod came out, the iPod Classic, or what we'd probably call the iPod Original now. But when that came out, it was great. You'd put your CDs in, you'd put the 1,000 songs in your pocket. What really changed the music industry and what really changed the scene for Apple was 2003, 28th of April 2003. That's when iTunes Music was launched. Mm. Now, Apple did some pretty heavy deals behind the scenes. So when they launched it, there were 200,000 songs on iTunes Music that you could have any one of those for 99 cents. And then suddenly people went, oh, this iPod thing. 
that's okay, because I can just go into iTunes Music, click on that song, buy it, 99 cents. I don't need to buy a whole CD. I don't need to buy a whole album. I've listened to that album, and there's one or two good songs, and I'll just pay 99 cents per song. Mm. That's much better, more economical, but convenience. Now, 200,000 songs is a but, bit of a joke. That was a big thing, too, because I remember Napster um, was a big thing yeah. around that, just before that time, yeah. and then all sorts of legal things happened there, and, and it, it turned into an absolute mess. Yeah. Um, and um, the fact that they were selling songs for 99 cents was like, well, it's only 99 cents. Yep. I'll throw the money at that, and that's all right. And Napster, you're right. You could get, use Napster to get songs in there, but they're all illegal. Yeah, so all that illegal, was the but it was all free. You know, and, and it just seemed like this this ridiculous um, access uh, was available. And yep. um, but but then you know, with Apple just selling songs to, so cheaply, yeah. it was like, well, I don't mind paying ninety nine cents. The fact that I bought. Three hundred songs. <laughs> it's been three hundred dollars, and you didn't notice at ninety nine cents a pop. Nah. But then you looked at it at the end of the month, and you go, "Holy oh, truth, how much did I spend?" <laughs> but you're but right; it worked. It just worked. Behind the scenes, Apple had done this, the deals with the various music companies and said, "We'll pay you." Napster's basically ripping you off. We'll pay you, maybe not as much as you want, because Apple wanted to make money along the way as well. Mm. But it went off. So the two hundred thousand songs are available is a bit of a joke because now, well. You've got huge numbers of songs available. Probably 30 million songs are available mm. now. So 200,000 sounded good at the time, but so many. But within 15 months of iTunes Music being launched, 100 million songs have been sold. So wow. that sounds like about $100 million have been generated. Now, again, Apple didn't keep all that because they were paying the record companies, but they were still generating significant dollars. You go further, the first billion songs only took three years from launch date, billion wow. songs. So 100 million within 15 months. So the next year and a bit or a year and three quarters didn't take long to get to that billion songs. And then within 10 years, 25 billion songs have wow. been sold. So when we think, oh, yeah, 100 million, 100 million dollars, that's not too bad. 25 billion songs at a dollar each. Wow, that's about 25 <laughs> billion dollars. So that starts to get to some yeah. significant dollars. So that's where that whole change has happened. And interestingly enough, I did write an article about this about a year or so ago where I talked about the fact that they were so far ahead of the game and everyone tried to catch up. Spotify came along about 2008, but they were trying to run a subscription service and no one wanted it. And Apple said, no, we won't ever charge you a subscription. Once you buy that song, you own it, in inverted commas, you don't really own it, you own permission to play that song, but you effectively have the ability to play that song. You don't need to worry about paying next month and next month. Apple actually missed an opportunity there to go to subscription because someone like Spotify came along and other companies as well and went down the subscription model. Don't pay 99 cents per song anymore, James. Have every one of the songs you've ever wanted <laughs> yeah. and then you just pay your monthly fee. And so Apple are doing that now, but it took them a while to get to, to that point because up. other companies came along and jumped in there. But do you know what I really liked and what really uh, I noticed was a difference um, when we could buy stuff through iTunes was, was all those... Um, those old songs uh, uh, that, that you know you really enjoyed from years back, um, you go to a, a CD store and you'd, you'd flick through and you'd go looking for it. And they they don't stock that album anymore. <laughs> you know, you kidding me? They, don't, they didn't have that album, so yeah, you know, you'd sigh and you move on. Um, but with with iTunes, you're able to locate the song, but you didn't have to buy the whole album. You just bought the song that you wanted. Yeah, that's right. So I didn't have to buy more than uh, like any more than um, you know Boston's more than a feeling um, <laughs> and I had to buy that song and only that song and it, it was mine and I didn't have to worry about all the other stuff because I wasn't a big Boston fan yeah and that's even better with subscription because I've been in the car sometimes and I'd think of a song and I'd say to the kids oh this is a great song by someone I don't know where it is or, oh wait up I can just ask my car to play that song yeah. for me. And away it goes. So with a subscription service, you don't even pay for that song because yeah. the kids play it for 20 seconds and go, Dad, this is a terrible old song. Get rid <laughs> of it. So you didn't want to pay a dollar for them to give you a hard time. So with subscription services, you've got all those songs without having to pay yeah. individually. So it's changed. But again, Apple's at the forefront. And Apple now worth, well, they hit the trillion dollar market a little while ago, a significant company in the world tech. And really, that's what really started pushing them towards that Zenith that are at now. I just, I, I wonder if anyone could have predicted how entertainment would have changed, um, you know, from 20 years ago to today, uh, you know, subscription services and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. It's just yeah. And so many away. things need to come together because even just the iPod, that first iPod had five gigs of memory. Mm. Well, that sounded okay for a thousand songs, but now, of course, you've got five gigs. What a joke. So there's mm. so many things that need to happen with mm. ubiquitous internet connections and how small they're getting and the battery's getting better. So where we are now, 
you would have needed to pre- have predicted so many different changes to mm. get to where we are now, which mm. maybe someone could have, Nostradamus maybe. <laughs> Back in the old days, before COVID-19, organising a meeting was easy. You bought a few coffees, put them in the boardroom and let the smell of coffee permeate throughout the office. Now you have to schedule a conference call, integrate different platforms, share content, control a room. It all gets too complicated. That is until you use Crestron to create a seamless hybrid working environment to manage your Teams or Zoom or WebEx meeting and focus on what is important the people. Visit meetwithcrestron.com forward slash tech talk to take your pain away. Oh, goodness me. And so we pull the curtain on another cracking week of tech talk with Matthew Dixon. Matt, I'm loving the idea of the big old shiny Chevy with shimmering chrome trim and white wall tyres, elbow out the window with wavefarers on, you know, and just the quiet whiz of an electric motor as it pulls up at the lights. Actually, Cadillac, I sat in a Cadillac. There was a 1948 Cadillac I sat in, and it was incredibly advanced. They had things like high beam dimmers, automatic high beam dimmers. They had uh, electric yeah. windows on it. And I've got, wow, for yeah. 1948, this is fantastic. Yeah. So imagine <laughs> taking that technology and dropping that electric motor in it. That would be really cool. That would be awesome. Yeah, yeah. Well, folks, thanks for tuning in to Tech Talk for another week. And just to mention for our listeners, we've actually been named a finalist in the Australian Woo! Podcast of the Year. There are six finalists in that. We're one of the finalists in the category known as the Smartest Podcast, which I don't mind that. If we yeah, win a category right. that says we've got the Ooh, Smartest yeah, Podcast, that's right. That's not too bad. So those awards will be announced in about a month's time. So we'll let listeners know how we go. Look at the Australian Podcast Awards. You can go and Google that and look at all the finalists for a bunch of different categories. Very happy, very proud to have that. And so people out there listening know that there is some external recognition for the quality of the podcast we're putting out. Feels pretty cool. Yeah. <laughs> and it's all part of the service, people bringing you such a quality uh, podcast. And a uh, big old shout out to a friend of mine, uh, Shane Sassian, a long time listener and avid Geelong supporter. Meow to you, my friend. Meow to you. I'm your host, James Eddy. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Subscribe.